Jane Eyre was written by Charlotte Bronte in 1857 and published anonymously under the androgynous pseudonym Cara Bell. It was almost instantly famous, catapulting her immediately into the upper echelon of Victorian writers. One of its most immediate supporters was the famous author William Makepeace Thackeray, who delighted in the story, which, considering that he himself had a mentally ill wife that had withdrawn from society, is more than a little astonishing, especially since there was a pervasive rumour circulating at the time that the novel had been written by his own governess to describe his life. Still, he continued to show public support, and Charlotte Bronte herself was delighted, dedicating her second edition to him. There are arguments as to whether the book itself follows the three, five, or seven scene story structure. My argument is for five. First, her unhappy childhood. Second, her education at Lowood School. Third, her days as a governess for Mr. Rochester. Fourth, her time with her cousins. And fifth, her reuniting with Mr. Rochester and her marriage. This novel is suitably complicated to make an easy genre hard to define. Depending on your perspective, it's either a rags to riches story about an orphan obtaining respectability, a clever gothic fantasy highlighting the subjugation of Victorian women, or a brave Bildungsroman in which a woman achieves independence through extreme exertion of emotional intelligence and will. At the beginning of the book, Jane Eyre is locked in a red room by her evil aunt. We soon discover that it is the room in which her uncle has died and overwrought with emotion as she is, Jane thinks she feels the ghost of her uncle trying to enter the room. Although short, the psychological overtones of this section of the novel are incredibly broad. And whether you see this as a symbol for abuse, for pregnancy, for violation, or as a useful way of describing Jane's histrionic character, or unsettling the reader prior to a gradual building of atmospherics, it is unforgettable. Jane Eyre is semi-autobiographical, which gives you a pretty good account of just how crummy the Bronte life was. The school on which she modelled Lowood essentially gave her and her sisters tuberculosis. John Reed's descent into gambling and alcoholism in the book reflects her own brother's descent into opium and gambling in real life. Her mother died during childhood, her father was severe, the Yorkshire Moors were desolate, and Charlotte Bronte herself died in a relatively loveless marriage in her mid-forties. The pervading sense of gloom, which you find in many of the Bronte works, seems entirely justified. Jane Eyre basically never belongs, right up until the moment where she meets her cousins. First she's an orphan, then she is a governess. And it's important to remember just what marginal people governesses were in society. Strange half figures somewhere between the servants and the aristocracy. Governess was basically the only job available at the time for respectable middle class women. They were simultaneously expected to be at the mercy of and yet exercise control over the children whom they were employed to look after, placing them in an impossible position. The perfect allegory for Jane Eyre herself. Jane Eyre isn't too far off being a fairy tale, albeit a very gothic one. The book is full of myth and superstition. Even in the words, Rochester referring to Jane as his elf or his changeling or his witch. In the weather, in the storms, in the strange happenings, in the way that Jane has a mysterious sense that Rochester needs her. Think of the fairy tales you know, Cinderella with her evil stepmother, Bluebeard and the one room that his new wife wasn't allowed to open, Beauty and the Beast and the gruff and terrifying figure who turns out to be good underneath it all. All of this adds to the pervading sense of surreality which suffuses the novel beautifully. As we all know, Mr Rochester has a terrible secret. A mad, passionate, libidinous, angry, vaguely ethnic secret wife hidden in the loft. Over the course of the novel she shapes the narrative in a few key pivotal ways, creeping out to damage Jane's wedding dress and eventually setting fire to the house itself and injuring Mr Rochester. The question of what she means as a character and what she could possibly represent is endlessly debated. 
Bertha as a representation of the treatment of Victorian women. Bertha as a representation of the marginalisation of anyone who didn't fit the white, pretty, middle-class stereotype acceptable in society at the time. Bertha as a representation of Jane Eyre's own rage at the unenlightenment of society and the subjugation of women. Bertha as a representation of Jane's own repressed id and her own lust and anger and pain and passion and violence. Bertha as a counterpoint of Jane and an indication of what might happen to her if she doesn't learn to control her own passions. Bertha as a projection of Jane's own fears about what will happen if she allows her free spirit to be bound into marriage. In fact, there are so many theories about what Bertha may represent that I think the question of what Bertha may represent is almost immaterial. Not to be too glib, but Bertha represents whatever you wish her to represent. She is there as a counterpoint of your own conscience. She is the reflected depth of your own soul. See in Bertha what you need to. This abject figure is used to being exploited. Not to get all Game of Thrones on you, but the sheer number of times that either fire or ice are mentioned in Jane Eyre is astonishing. Quite apart from the fact that the tree burns down and then the house burns down, we have constant referrals to heat of passion, flame, fiery character, ice, icebergs, ice and rock. Jane accepting Rochester because he makes her burn, rejecting St John Rivers because he is cold as an iceberg. In fact, if you're annotating your own copy, it's worth highlighting those elemental mentions for yourself. The number of them is staggering. Jane Eyre has been adapted for film, television, radio, theatre, at least two full-length operas, and some complete reimaginings, including the seminal work, The Wide Sargasso Sea. Of course, little can beat reading the original. But as to whether you come out of it feeling elated or depressed, it's genuinely hard to call. Thanks for watching.